country. Grab your Bibles, open up. Uh, we're going to be in Matthew chapter 9. We've made it to chapter 9. Uh, we are talking about a sermon series called Jesus, Our Healer. We are at the beginning of Matthew chapter 9. Uh, and, and as we kind of worked our way through this, right, we turn our attention today uh, to what I will call in this, this, this section of chapters 8 and chapter 9, the most critical healing of all. Uh, today we see kind of what is the heartbeat of Jesus' healing ministry, and it's the soul, right? We have seen Jesus heal diseases. We have watched as Jesus has healed demon possession. We have seen him heal even nature around us, right? Storms, hurricanes. Today he heals the soul, and it's a healing that we all need. So I'm going to pray for us. And we're going to jump right in. Lord God, today I pray, God, that our eyes are open and that we see clearly. Uh, I pray that our ears are attentive and that we hear your word, Lord, and that it makes its way into our minds and it, it changes how we think, how we see ourselves, how we see the world around us, God. And I pray then that it makes that 18-inch migration down to our hearts and it changes how we live our lives. God made the seed that is planted today. There's, there's so many opportunities for, for us, Lord, when we walk out of here for just like the cares of the world, the, the school and job and stress and money and military and all this stuff just to kind of choke it out. God, I pray that does not happen. Lord, there's, there's a chance that some of us are sitting here today and we're so just distracted by everything going on that, that your word today is just going to bounce off of it like, like seed off a hard path. God, I pray that is not us today. Lord, there's going to be some of us seated here today, God, that, that your word is going to find a place in our heart and it, it's going to bloom very quickly. But, but as we move out into school and into work and into interactions with family and friends, that, that scorching sun of disdain or persecution, God, are just going to burn it up. And Lord, I pray that does not happen. But that this word finds purchase in our minds and in our hearts, and it grows and it bears fruit, God, and fruit that we could never imagine, but fruit in our lives, in the lives of our families, and in the lives of our community around us. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. I'm going to pick up in Matthew chapter 9. I'm going to read verses 1 through 8. And getting into the boat, he he being Jesus, crossed over and came to his own city. And behold, some people brought to him a paralytic lying on a bed. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Take heart, my son, your sins are forgiven. And behold, some of the scribes said to themselves, This man is blaspheming. But Jesus, knowing their thoughts, said, Why do you think evil in your hearts? For which is easier to say, Your sins are forgiven, or to say, Rise and walk. But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he then said to the paralytic, Rise, pick up your bed, and go home. And he rose and went home. And when the crowd saw it, they were afraid, and they glorified God, who'd given such authority to men. Matthew uh, doesn't tell us exactly how much time has passed between Jesus' interaction with the two demoniacs in the Gadarenes and the demon-possessed herd of pigs, which undoubtedly left its mark on everybody involved. Uh, he simply tells us that Jesus got into the boat and crossed back over to Capernaum, right? They had sailed from the north. P. 
period of time, the, the Gospel of Mark, which records this same series, this same uh, passage, tells us he stayed there a few days. Uh, so Jesus and his disciples stayed there for a few days, got a little bit of rest, and then followed that orange line all the way back up to Capernaum, where they returned home. Uh, and we don't know how long they were back there. And behold, some people brought to him a paralytic lying on a bed. The crowds come back, right? Uh, and Jesus is in a home. We don't know whose home it is. Probably Peter's, right? Remember, Peter has moved from Bethsaida to Capernaum, and that's now the base of operation. So it's most likely there, but we don't know that. We do know that Jesus was teaching and preaching in that home. Mark tells us that as well. And then this, this giant crowd kind of forms. So Jesus is, is sitting in this home. There are people crowded around him at the home. There are people spilling over out around the home. And they're probably standing, looking in the windows. They're outside the door. They're probably in the streets around so that like, there's just this massive mob of people around this house. And Jesus is teaching and preaching. Uh, and so here's kind of the viewpoint of what happens today. This group of friends... And we don't know how many of them were. We know there were at least four men because they're each carrying the corner uh, of this paralytic's mat. But it it, it says a group of friends, right? Could be men, could be women. We don't know. This group of friends approaches. They've heard Jesus is back. They knew he was gone. They heard him was back. They get to the house where he is, and the crowd is so thick and so intent on what Jesus is saying that they can't get through. They're trying to get in to get their friend to Jesus, but they can't get there, so they get worried. They're like, what are we going to do, right? Like probably tapping on people's shoulders, trying to move people, but the crowd, for whatever reason, is not very amenable to letting other people come through, even a paralytic. So they get a little desperate. Each Jewish house in this particular period of time uh, would have on its roof like a, like a small, it's almost like a, what we would think of as like a porch, like you go out and sit on your porch in the evening, you know, as, as the sun's kind of going down and you, you have a cup of coffee or, you, you know, you read your Bible or you watch the kind of sunset. Well, it's, it's very hot in this area, so you, you want to get out of your house, which is just sweltering with heat by this point in the day, so you'd go up on top of it into this open-air booth. So they all had on the outside usually a ladder or some kind of stairs that would go up to the top of this. So these friends take their paralytic, and they go around to the back of the house. And they climb up on top of the house. And meanwhile, Jesus is still preaching. Jesus is still teaching. Maybe people are starting to watch them going, hmm, wonder what these people are doing. But they're up on top of the roof. Dust is starting to fall, right, as they're moseying around up there. And then they start to tear the roof off the house. So imagine the scene if you're down there. Imagine the scene if I were standing here preaching now, right, and the ceiling started to just kind of fall in, right? Insulation's coming down, pieces of metal. Like Jesus is sitting there teaching, and everybody's just kind of starting to go, what's going on up there, right? Peter, imagine you're Peter, and if this is Peter's house, right, he's on the phone, you know, with Allstate going, Am I protected from mayhem like this? Because these ding-dongs are on my roof, ripping it up, yes? And at some point, they get a hole in the roof big enough that they can lower down a full-grown man on a pallet while Jesus is still preaching and lay him down in front of Jesus. Now, Here's what this this group of friends, they're hoping, we're going to get this man in front of Jesus, and Jesus is going to do what Jesus has been doing for months and months and months. He's going to lay his hand on him, or he's going to say a word, and he's going to heal his paralysis, right? And I'm sure that's what this guy is thinking too. Just get me to Jesus, and Jesus can heal my body, and I can get up and walk again. And they get him into the house. And they lay him down, and Jesus looks at him and says, Take heart, my son, your sins are forgiven. Now, 
that phrase touches off a variety of reactions, which we'll talk about kind of through this whole thing. But imagine you're the paralytic. I don't know about you, but probably the first thought that would have gone through my head is, that's not what I was looking for. You know, like, okay, great. How about my legs? He came to have his legs healed. And when Jesus, the healer, pronounces him healed of his sins, I cannot imagine that he was not deeply disappointed. Because Jesus, but, 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 Jesus knows something far more important than we do. And here's the first thing if you're taking notes. That between sin and sickness, sin is the more critical issue. Sin is more critical than sickness. Apparently, I changed my notes after I sent it to them. Sin is more critical than sickness. Jesus sees the man, and it's clear, right? He can't walk. We assume his legs are paralyzed. We're not sure, right? We can talk about it a little bit more in a minute. But he's damaged in some way. Maybe it's his arms. Maybe it's his torso. Maybe it's his legs as well. And so his friend group, right, perhaps men and perhaps women, have gone through a lot of effort to get him here, a lot of planning, a lot of exertion. They're carrying. They've destroyed property. Perhaps they have some legal issues now, right? There's this delicate operation of lowering him down from the roof, and now he's in front of Jesus, right, the man who can heal leprosy and who can heal paralysis and who can heal demon possession, and their hopes are sky high. But when Jesus says your sins are forgiven, like it's just like a deflated balloon. But Jesus knows something that these people don't know. And he knows that at the end of the day, sin is more serious than sickness. Sickness brings misery now, right? It brings misery now. It brings pain. It brings suffering. It brings limitations. But it will be gone in the life to come. There will, be no, there will be no cancer, there will be no, there will be no diabetes, there will be no broken bones, there will be no none of that, right? Perfect bodies, perfect minds, perfect relationships, no, no fear, no, no anxiety, no depression, all of it will be gone. Sickness exists in this world and in this world only. And it brings misery in this world and in this world only. Sin, however, brings misery in both. It brings misery now, right? It brings pain. It brings suffering. It brings broken relationships, right? It brings limitations, and it brings suffering in the next world, in judgment and in hell. And Jesus knows that at the end of the day, this man needs to be healed, but he needs his sin and his soul healed more than he needs his body healed. And so Jesus looks at him and says, take heart, my son, your sins are forgiven. Jesus can heal disease, Jesus can heal demons, Jesus can heal nature, and Jesus can heal and forgive sins. There's your point up there now, right? Jesus is a healer in every aspect of life, church. But when we think about it, if you look at kind of the history of the Bible, Jesus as a healer of the body uh, isn't all that different than some prophets that have gone before. Previous prophets have healed. Elisha has healed, right? This is not something that's outside of the scope of what God's prophets normally do, right? Jewish priests had some people that would come and try to do exorcisms. There's some evidence that uh, to a, a certain degree uh, that those were successful, from time to time, but no one, no one can control the weather, and no one can forgive sins. Like only God can do those. But yet Jesus announces to everyone that this man's sins are forgiven. What is it that enables that? Like, wh why, why this guy? And at the end of the day, church, it's faith enables forgiveness. Here's one of the clearest statements in the Bible of what God is looking for and what sets us right 
with God. And we've talked about this, right? Like, what is Jesus looking for? When, they, when, when Jesus says, follow him, what is he looking for? He's looking for faith. That's it. Nothing else. Yes? Faith that he can heal you. Faith that he can be your healer, right? When Jesus says, right, and when he saw their faith, who's the there? Undoubtedly, it is the friends, but it also includes the paralytic. When Jesus saw all of their faith, he looks at him and says, son, your sins are forgiven. Like, what is it that God is looking for from you? And the answer is simply faith, right? What is it that gets us to heaven instead of hell? Faith. That's it, right? What is it that brings us out of darkness and into the light? Faith. That's it. What is it that, that turns gardens or graves into gardens? Faith. That's what God is looking for, right? Right? Their faith was written all over everything that they did. From bringing their friend to tearing a hole to lowering him down to sitting there trusting that this man could heal him. And Jesus saw that faith and said, your sins are forgiven. Your sins are forgiven. And you would think there'd be a celebration, but there's not. What I imagine happened at that point when Jesus said, take heart, my son, your sins are forgiven, is is there was a murmuring in the crowd going on, right, as he's talking and all this is happening. People are whispering. But as soon as he says that, I imagine the crowds went silent. And doubt started creeping in. We certainly know they did with the scribes, but I imagine they did with the crowds. The crowds and the scribes begin to doubt what Jesus has just said. As Jesus is teaching and preaching and as a roof is being demolished and a man is being lowered down, there's a buzz of conversation, there's whispering, they're talking. As soon as Jesus says this, the place goes quiet because everybody knew only God can do that. And everybody begins to think, who is this guy, right? But especially the scribes, what does it say? And the scribes said to themselves, this man is blaspheming. And Jesus looks at him and says, why are you thinking evil thoughts? Blasphemy, if you're not familiar, is a sin against God's majesty, right? It's, it's taking something that only God is capable of or worthy of and kind of bringing it down to the realm of men, right? G- only God is able to forgive sin. So to, to take that ability and bring it down to our level, to something that a man or a woman can do, is blasphemy, right? It's, 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 it's a sin against God's majesty and against God's holiness. And so the scribes are thinking, this man has just said that he can do what only God can do. And that's a sin against God. That's blasphemy. And everyone, honestly, probably even including the disciples, know what Jesus has just claimed, right? They understand what's happening here. They understand that that what Jesus has just done is is a massive escalation of his claims of who he is. And so there's doubt. There's doubt with the scribes. I'm sure there's some with the crowds around him. And so what does Jesus do? Jesus heals the body to give evidence of the healing of the soul. In the face of doubts as to his claims of being able to forgive sins, Jesus asks the question, well, tell me, guys, what's easier to say? Your sins are forgiven or to say, rise and walk? So I'll ask you that question. Which one of those is easier? Is it easier to say your sins are forgiven, right? If, if someone walked up to you and said, My son, my daughter, your sins are forgiven. Are they? Are they not? Is there some visible change? Like, you don't know, right? It's it's, it's not immediately apparent as to whether anything has happened. But if you are a paralytic and somebody walks up to you and says, rise, take up your mat and go home, and you don't rise, take up your mat and go home, well, they know the guy's a fraud. Yes? There's a pretty clear... So on, on the surface... It, it, it sounds easier to say, oh, my son, your sins are forgiven. Go, right? Everything's good. You can't tell. 
But if you say, your cancer's gone, and you go back to the doctor in a week, and it's not gone. Or your leg is healed, and you get up, and you fall over. You know, they're a fraud. Beneath the surface, it's easier to say, or excuse me, on the surface, it's easier to say your sins are forgiven. Beneath the surface, though, it's a whole lot easier to heal the body than it is to heal the soul. Doctors can heal the body. Medicines can heal the body. Physical therapy can heal the body. Surgeries can heal the body. It's much, much harder to heal the soul. To forgive sin, to wipe away a debt that's owed to God for breaking his law or not loving your neighbor or not loving him, like only God can do. No doctor can do that. No prophet can do that. No priest can do that. No shaman can do that. No one can do that but God. Jesus wants to build their faith, right? He wants to build your faith so that you'll trust him. So he says, and here's that title again, right? Son of man. I told you we'd see it a lot. But that you may know the son of man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He said to the paralytic, rise, pick up your bed, and go home. Jesus uses the healing of the body to evidence the healing of the soul. Yes? Jesus does the greater healing, which you can't see, but then does the lesser healing to prove that it has been done. Yes? So that you know I can do this. Rise, take up your mat, and go home. And the dude stood up and picked up his bed, and they all went home. The lesser but more visible healing validates the greater but less visible healing. And that leads to fear and praise. The crowd, the crowd got a little scared at that point. I mean, do you see what it says there? Right? And when the crowd saw it, they were afraid. Right? They understood what was happening here. They understood that they were in the presence of someone with a greater authority, with the authority that only God has. And they were a little scared of that. And honestly, like sometimes I don't think we're, we're a little scared of exactly who Jesus is. Like, the man is God, right? He is the creator, the redeemer, the judge, and honestly, that should put a little holy fear in each one of us. But it also brings praise that that man can forgive and heal and restore, right? And so they begin to praise and glorify God that such things were possible. Okay. What do we do with this? Let's turn the corner here. If you're, if you're not familiar with Gallup Hill and how we kind of do things here, we spend the first part of the message kind of looking at, you know, what, what do the scriptures have to say? And then we go back for the second part and we say, okay, what does that mean for us? Got a handful of things for you guys to think about today. Number one means Jesus is healer of the world. Of the world. Let's, let's take a step back. And look at the big picture here. Jesus is the one who can touch you and make you clean and take away your disease and restore you to community. Jesus is the one who can touch you or, 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 or be near you and cast out any demon that you might have, restore you to health and sanity and walking. Jesus is the one that can heal your heart and help you see that all your good works can earn your healing, but that your faith can lead you out of darkness and into life. Jesus is one that will bring all the peoples of the earth together from east and west and bring them together at the banquet of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, right? Jesus is the one that will heal even the earth. He can calm storms, whatever it is. So this in church, here's where I'm going with this. There is nothing in your life, there is not one single thing in your life or in this world that you cannot bring to him and say, Jesus, I need help with this. He is master and controller of it all. And that's what Matthew's trying to get at here. Whether it's an issue in our hearts, whether it's an issue in our relationships, whether it's an issue with our jobs, whether it's an issue on the planet or wars or whatever's going on, there is nothing that Jesus cannot take and heal. 
And just like his disciples in the boat in the midst of the storm, he's waiting for us to say, Lord, help, I'm having a hard time with this. There's nothing, like, I don't know about you guys, sometimes there's like, like there's stuff I pray about, like, God, you know, help with this, and there's stuff is like, I, you know, I'll figure this out. But what Matthew is trying to get to us, and, and what Jesus is saying here, is there shouldn't be two categories of, here's the stuff I need to talk to Jesus about, and here's stuff we'll just figure out. It's just one category. There's not like the, here's like the spiritual stuff that I need help with, and here's the kind of the day-to-day stuff that, that I can just kind of go through, and, you know, me and Marsha, or me and, you know, you guys, or me and whoever can just kind of figure out that it's all under his control and that he is standing by, willing and able to heal all of it. So guys, as you walk out of here today, don't walk out going, ah, okay, I got all this I got to deal with today for tomorrow, for Monday. Right, bring it to Christ. He's Lord of it all. That's the first thing. There's nothing outside of his purview. He is concerned with everything and he can heal everything. Here's the second thing. Jesus forgives in this passage, right? Take heart, my son, your sins are forgiven. He does that on the basis of the cross and of the resurrection, right? Forgiveness comes from the cross and the resurrection. Forgiveness just isn't a pronouncement from God, right? Jesus pronounces that the man's sins have have been forgiven, Right? But God just doesn't forgive sin. It's not just like God looks down and goes, okay, it's all right this time. We'll just wipe this one off the map. Right? God's, God, God's justice will not allow him to do that. God is perfectly just. Right? What we do in this life, God looks at and judges perfectly. So right? It kind of answers the question for us, well, you know, what about all the people around? Like, can, can God just not forgive like, everybody everywhere all the time? And the answer to that question is, God is going to be perfectly just, and whatever you have earned, you will get. Now, I don't want that, but okay, right? Think about it like this. Uh, sin is like a debt, right? We all are familiar with the concept of debt. Sin is like a debt. So imagine every time, every time we sin, every time we don't give God something he is due, love, praise, obedience, like we've withheld it from him. So we owe him. You you follow me? Sin creates a debt. Every time we don't love our neighbor like we should, sin creates a debt. Every time we we do something for ourselves that's self-centered, that that should have been more others-centered, sin creates a debt. And it just keeps accumulating over and over and over throughout the course of life. And Scripture tells us that the wages of that sin, that accumulation of spiritual debt, eventually comes due, and there's two ways to pay it. Either in hell or through Christ on the cross. You can either pay it yourself or someone else can pay it for you. Jesus says to this man, the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins. That power comes through the cross. The cross is where Christ climbs up, pays the debt for sin. All of it, right? Christ paid the debt so that God's mercy and grace could be extended to you. And yet God's justice could be accomplished at the exact same time. And just like Jesus validates the forgiveness of the man's sins by healing his legs, so God validates the work on the cross by raising Jesus. Do you see? There's there's a parallel here. Jesus says your sins are forgiven, and to show you that your sins are forgiven, I'm going to heal your legs. God says your sins are forgiven on the cross, and to show you that I actually have forgiven your sins on the cross, I'm going to raise Christ from the dead. There's a parallel here to what's going on. Forgiveness for him and for us comes through the cross. And it's evidenced by the resurrection. Here's another. Christ will heal your doubts. 
I used to think it was a time in my life when I thought doubts were bad, right? I've come to realize that doubts as you move through life are a sign of growing faith, that you're starting to struggle with deeper things, that you're starting to try to figure out how does all of this apply to my life. Doubts are okay. Doubts are being part uh, of human. It's part of the road of faith. safe to assume that everybody here in this passage probably wondered if Jesus really could forgive sins. And then Jesus graciously reacted to their doubts and gave them the evidence. Here's the thing. Jesus will react to your doubts. He did it here. The crowds, presumably the disciples, accepted it and praised God. The scribes, though the text is silent to their reaction, will learn they did not. They'll slowly turn away from Jesus, and the very things that are meant to soften them will harden them. But whatever your doubts are, Jesus will give you what you need to overcome them if you're willing to accept them. Often you'll see the reassurance you need in the pages of Scripture. Sometimes you'll see it in the work of God's people around you. Sometimes you'll see just a special work of God in your life, but whatever your doubts are, bring them to Jesus. Bring them to a friend. Bring them to a deacon. Bring them to a pastor. Bring them to an elder. Don't keep them inside. Christ is waiting to answer them. If you notice, it says the scribes said to themselves they weren't willing to bring those doubts out into the open. Jesus still tries to address them. Don't leave them huddled up inside. Bring them to Christ. and He's willing to deal with them. And here's the last thing I'll leave you. And probably what I think is outside of the, the forgiveness of sins aspect of, of what's going on in this passage. It, to me, this is the, the second largest thing. Church, cultivate Christian friendships. This is, this is a beautiful passage on friendship. Uh, and if you, I don't know, if you, if you look around, like friendship is under assault in our kind of world. Assault, honestly, by technology, right? Like we, we think friendship can exist inside one of these things. Uh, or a phone. Really can't. Uh, we have friends on Facebook or social media or or whatever it is. Real friendship exists in community. You know, even, even as I was in the church this morning, kind of walking around, you know, there's some people gathering, talking. There's others just kind of sitting on their phones. In the midst of people, right? On our phones. I want to encourage you to cultivate Christian friendships. You know, you, you, you look at the friends in this passage, right? Uh, it, it doesn't say much about them other than they had faith and, and they brought their buddy uh, to Jesus and destroyed Peter's house, you know? So, uh, some good friend, right? Good friends will help you deface property. That's not the, <laughs> it's not what we're looking for here. But I'll, I'll tell you, if, if the day comes when I'm paralyzed or, you know, some disease or sickness or just down or like just beaten up, right, I want that group of people that aren't just going to text me like, hey, praying for you, hope you're doing okay, or, you know, Facebook message. I want that group of people that are going to come get me, pick me up, take me to wherever I need to go, like rip a hole in somebody's roof and drop me down so that I might be healed, right? Like, that's the group of people that I want. And you're not going to find that in your phone, people. You're going to find it standing around the tables in the back. You're going to find it at the lunchroom at school. You're going to find it, right, in in the galley on the boat, huddled around the table, right? You're going to find it at, at... you know, the Christian fellow, you're going to find it in these places, but you actually have to be with human beings. And we are a society in desperate need of that. And I want to encourage you as a church 
to be intentionable. Intentionable, that's not a word. Intentional about developing that. Like this is this is a sermon to me too, because I'm I'm not I'm not always the best at making friends. I don't know. For some reason, it's harder for me than than it is for other people. But you need them, right? We know there was at least four. You don't have to have twenty or fifty or a hundred. But do you have a handful of people that you can say when everything hits the fan, these people will come to my house, pick up my bed, carry me out? And take me to where I need to go. If you don't, today's the day to start. Like, I don't know how to tell you to do it. Maybe, maybe you'll find it in a community group here. Maybe you'll find it in a men's group here. Maybe you'll find it in a women's group. Maybe you'll find it standing around a coffee table. Maybe you'll find it at, at Thanksgiving. And, but you have to be intentional about it. Look for it. Search for it. Find it because you need it. And then don't let it go. Because when you do find it, oh man, like it's worth it, guys. I don't know what these guys did when they left. I imagine they went back and threw one heck of a party, right? But that's what friends do. We come to the Lord's table today. Uh, we come to the Lord's table as a church body, right? As, as brothers and sisters, but hopefully as friends as well. We come to the Lord's table today celebrating uh, the work that Christ did on the cross that forgave sin. We come to the Lord's table today looking forward to that time where we will all be in heaven celebrating, right? Together. We come to the Lord's table today remembering that Christ has healed our souls. Even if our bodies remain broken and age and time and just unfortunate and all this just conspires to break these bodies. We come knowing that if we have come to Jesus in faith, our soul is healed. And that that will bring us into this next world and give us a body that will never break. I'm going to come down. I'm inviting you know, Worship team, you guys can, can come back up. We come to the communion table today. Uh, I said this a little bit earlier, but, but I'll say it kind of again now. All right, Paul warns us uh, in the scriptures, right, that we come to communion. You should come expecting, right, expecting to re-encounter Jesus, but you should also make sure you don't come to the Lord's table uh, with unconfessed sin in your heart. So I want to give us just a moment here uh, to go before God and just, if, if there's anything in there that you just need to let go of, that you let go of it. Uh, I'll pray, I'll pause, and uh, just give you a moment to pray by yourselves, and then we'll continue with communion. Father God, we come before you today, Lord, with, with minds and hands and hearts stained by sin. Father, things that we did, things that we said, things that we thought that we should not have done, God. Cleanse us. Father, we come with hands and minds and hearts stained by the good that we left undone. The things we should have said that we didn't. The things we should have done that we didn't. Father, forgive us when we fail you by remaining silent or withholding the good from you and from our neighbor. Hear our prayers this morning, Lord, as we bring them to you. Father, we pray all these through the power of your Holy Spirit and in the name of your Son, Jesus. Amen. I'll ask our deacons to come forward.
The Apostle Paul wrote, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Bread is a symbol, the body of the Lord Jesus broken for you. Take and eat. Lord Jesus, we give you thanks for your willingness to come and suffer in our stead. Let us never forget the work that you did that day on that cross. You for us that we might enter into glory. We thank you and we praise you. Amen. Paul continues, in the same way he also took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes.
cup is a symbol of the blood of the Lord Jesus spilled for you. Take and drink. Lord, today we come remembering your blood dripping from the cross. Remind us that it is because of that blood that you can say, my child, your sins are forgiven. And remind us too that however we might stumble, we might fall today, tomorrow, the next day, that your blood is sufficient to continue to cleanse sin. So Jesus, remind us to come back each time and simply say, Lord, I love you. Forgive me. Help me to walk with you. Keep us doing that over and over and over and over again, Jesus, until that day comes where we don't have to say it anymore. And we glorify and praise you forever. I pray in the name of Christ. Amen. Thank you, deacons. You guys stand as we sing and worship and praise the Lord.
All right, Gallup Hill, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face to shine upon you. May he be gracious to you and give you his peace. God bless. We'll see you next week. If I can ask one favor as you make your way out, we do need to break the chairs down one more time. It is a youth retreat this coming weekend. 